UUFN is an inclusive community that nurtures spiritual and intellectual growth and fosters ethical and social responsibility. If you are a visitor, either online or in person, we are glad you are with us, and we invite you to stay after the service to get acquainted. We welcome your questions and look forward to getting to know you. Later in the service today, we will take our Share the Plate offering as a way to care for the wider world. This month's Share the Plate recipient is Minnesota Honor Tax, chosen by our Land Acknowledgement and Beyond Working Group. For thousands of years, the Dakota Iote lived in and cared for much of the land we know now as Minnesota. Even as external pressures pushed Dakota bands out of northern Minnesota, the Dakota continued to maintain traditional villages, hunting and gathering grounds, and travel routes throughout the area that stretches south across Minnesota, from Moorhead to Cambridge. Through treaties, wars, and broken promises, the United States took, the, took that Dakota land as its own. Today, we who live on the land can recognize and support the enduring sovereignty of the Lower Sioux Indian community by contributing to this honor tax. The tax is a voluntary payment made directly to the tribe. During the offering later, you may put cash or a check in the basket or donate online from our website simply write or if your check is your pledge simply write pledge on the memo line there will also be instructions on the screen during the offertory time i call your attention to the announcements in your order of service and your weekly email there you will find more information about the following there will be a special business meeting after the service today, at which time members will vote on whether to launch a capital campaign for a building addition. Non-members are welcome to attend, but only members may vote. Nita Wolf will be leading the RE group this Sunday. You can see the bulletin to learn more about that. For anyone who has not yet uploaded a photo into their Breeze account, Paul Krause has a camera to take your picture, and on your approval, we'll send, to you, uh, we'll send it to you and John Owens. If you need assistance, John can upload your photo to your profile in Breeze, so we have pictures of everyone in our online directory. Photos can be taken today. Join us next Sunday as Reverend Sarah Smalley presents a message titled Transforming Church. Unitarian Universalists are considering adding transformation as a core value. We adapt to the changing world. We covenant to collectively transform and grow spiritually and ethically. Openness to change is fundamental to our Unitarian and Universal, universal heritage. Never complete and never perfect. What does this mean for how we might transform and be transformed by our faith? especially if we let go of the pressure to be perfect. Again, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield.
Thank you, Taylor. Our reading today is a poem written by 2021 Immigrant Justice Fellow, Sarah Aliaga, titled, We Matter. You have crossed seas, mountains, and oceans. You came to a place you never imagined you would be. You brought with you the strength of a hurricane, and you carry with you the weight of the world on your shoulders. I see all of your hopes, dreams, and struggles. I know the way you feel about being in a place so foreign, for I have felt this way before too. The feeling that we don't belong haunts us every now and then. Home has become such a faraway place. We wonder when we will be able to smell the jasmine again and hear the sounds of the Adon coming from the mosque and visit our friends and family over a strong cup of Arabic coffee. Little do you know that when I speak with you, I get a little taste of home. We speak as if we've known each other for generations. The familiarity comforts us both in a way that we have been longing for. You give me the hope that is not lost in our community. Your kindness inspires me. Your gratitude fills me with so much hope and love. It makes me feel that I matter. It makes me feel that we matter. Come, let us worship together. <clears throat> the flaming chalice is the symbol of the Unitarian Universalism. Each Sunday when we gather, we bring this symbol to life together. Please join me in speaking the words for the lighting of the chalice. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Our opening hymn is number 128. Please rise in body or spirit for all that is our life. I invite you to allow yourself an unhurried breath. Relax your shoulders, inhale and exhale, and let your heart catch up with you in this moment. Rest in the embrace of a wider love.
In the presence of this love that holds us all, we use our chalice flame to light our candles of community. We light our first candle as a blessing for the wider world. We know too that the details of our daily lives are sacred and important. We now light a candle for all the simple joys that are sustaining us. And we light another candle in honor of the sorrows and hardships we might be carrying. Um, our first or candle in honor of the joys and sorrows we carry in our hearts, but that have not been spoken aloud. And we move into a time of silence. May the truth of your heart be reflected in these flames. Amen and blessed be. We will now take our offering. Our offering is one way we make our care for the world tangible. This month's Share the Plate recipient is Minnesota Honor Tax. You may donate by cash check uh, made out to UUFN with offering basket in the memo line or online from our website, uunorthfield.org. You can scroll down to the bottom of the homepage for the link. We now gratefully accept the offering. I am very happy to introduce our guest speaker today, coming to you via Zoom from Northern Minnesota. Jan Kurtz is, is presently retired from her official career as Spanish and Latin American studies instructor, but Spanish continues to be, uh, continues to weave itself into her everyday life. At age 15, she entered Mexico for a three week study homestay resulting in a lifelong journey with Spanish as her constant companion. Her book, Northern Shores and Southern Borders, Revelations of a Bilingual Life, chronicles medical missions, exchange students, travel, study in Central America, and the topic of this presentation, the Overground Railroad to Immigrant Caravans. 
Jan worked and lived at Jubilee Partners, Comer, Georgia in 1989 when the overground began to flourish throughout the United States in the period of US covert wars. Those times resulted in mass migration from south to north. Who were those immigrants then and who are they now? Looking at personal immigrant stories shifts the focus from statistics to personal stories involved in the havoc at the border and dysfunction of the immigration system. I welcome Jan Kurtz. <laughs> Hola, muy buenos días. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Yes, I am Jan Kurtz, and it is a real pleasure to be with you here today. I thank first Carol uh, for the invitation and her whole team for making this possible. So at this point, um, are we all good technologically? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because I'm looking at a wall. Anyway, um, as per the introduction, there is, somebody just walked by. As per the introduction, um, I have had Spanish be the major uh, thread throughout my entire life, which actually brings me to you today. And the stories come from my being literally and figuratively called into certain circumstances. So today I am going to, I guess I will call it, the, the itinerary for our journey today is a very quick look at what um, produced the situation that we have today, meeting some of these people from my work and also the most recently arrived, and um, just where you are on this journey of, of learning. So um, would you please start these slides and the one of the bus. Okay, meeting the immigrants. I'm calling this transformations to fit into your theme because uh, I don't know how an immigrant is not transformed by every step they take. And once we have met them, um, our life also changes. So to the quick history, no, I'm not gonna take you all the way back to Columbus, but do know that that's kind of where this all started. Instead, I'm going to take you to 1979 and the quick history whereby the Sandinistas of that time rebelled against the 40 year um, dictatorship of the Samosas in Nicaragua. And what resulted was a Reagan era covert war um, between the Sandinistas and the Contras. Some of you lived through this, but we can't pay attention to everything. So many people started to believe at that time that the communists were coming and that if one Central American nation, in this case Nicaragua, fell, then all of the rest of them, like dominoes, would also go to communism until they reached our borders. And mostly this overlooked a great deal of um, the politics and the economics of the time, because for not just decades, but centuries, the oligarchs, were not really paying good wages to the workers on their plantations. The government in place uh, was pretty much backing these oligarchs. The Catholic Church, and this is very simplified, basically said, well, if you wait until heaven, you will get your reward. <clears throat> Whereas, and I think you're familiar with liberation theology, there was more of a no, no, you know, we, we deserve to have good things on this earth and this life as well. So we have some competing um, situations going on that produced massive, um, well, violence. And because of this, just one example in El Salvador at this time, 14 families owned something like 90% of the land and the economics. And in that country alone, 70,000 civilians um, were killed. So people started to flee northwards. Slide two. This is a group that now, since it was from the 1980s, don't they look like a bunch of hooligans? But anyway, this was the group that I worked with in Jubilee Partners. And at this time in our U.S. history, a lot of people locally, talking about U.S., 
um, were very much opposed to the politics and what was going on in Central America. And some went to witness for peace and were on site. But I chose not to take my son into Central America, but this was a way that I could be much more active uh, in the cause than um, simply writing to the government people in charge. So at this time, the Quakers um, with Jim Corbett began really reactivating something that was called the Sanctuary Movement. And the Sanctuary Movement dated back to Old England when um, people who were running from the law or running from the government uh, could, in theory, go into a church and be safe until they left the church. The Sanctuary Movement, um, as being resurrected from the uh, Quakers, was not accepted by the United States government. So many people in churches and just, I don't know, from grandmas to pregnant women to anybody who helped a, a person coming across our borders uh, was open to, um, well, jail time, uh, fees, and um, just... Not, not violence in this country, but it was not allowed. And so the sanctuary movement was considered illegal, but the Overground Railroad became a legal way for immigrants to pass through the United States on their way to Canada. Canada had a project called Proyecto Canada, whereby people arriving would have one year of housing, they would get English, or maybe French, I don't know, but anyway, language lessons, they would have job training, they would be given certain jobs, and they would be integrated, hopefully within a year's time, into the Canadian lifestyle. So it became legal for people to help in the transition from the Texas border to the Canadian border. So what Jubilee Partners did was they got in that bus you just saw and they would drive down to Texas and there were already at that time detention centers and the detention centers were already overflowing. The detention center that Jubilee went to was at Port Isabel. It was out in the desert. So people that were being held in detention um, had to come up with a lawyer there might have been a pro bono lawyer. They needed to come up with someone to translate their documents. And they also needed to not only understand, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, the documents, but the legal system, to which I say good luck to all of us. So um, it was very, very difficult. And some of them were allowed because their story was bad enough to be accepted to be good enough to go on the overground to go to um, Canada. Next slide. And some of the people I met are here and I am not going to read this for you, but Dominga was one of my favorites um, and she ended up following her teenage son, Renee, all the way to the United States. <clears throat> they, um, well, with the reading a little bit, it was very common for the government, and this again is El Salvador in her case, to just go through town sometimes, and if a child, a boy, looked like he was tall enough, and maybe he would be 13 years old, um, they would be forcibly recruited, taken off into the jungles. Some very bad things happened to them to warn them what would happen if they ran away AWOL. But one day, Renee and one of his friends were ordered to go through a town after an attack and clean up um, any of those that had not been killed outright. And at this point, they held back and decided to make a run for it. So when he got to his mom's house, it was absolutely decided that both of them had to leave the country. And it took them about six months and working jobs and walking and buses to get to the border where they turned themselves in and were locked up at El Corralon. Next slide. Here's Dominga in one of her high moments. She was just given a pair of glasses and she could see again. She's just ecstatic. And she also got a new apron. The women working here with her um, also uh, came through the border, but in different ways. 
Uh, the younger girl there came with her family, and her father is pictured in the bottom with uh, one of her brothers. And they had family in Pennsylvania already, so we're trying to get through to be reunited. And there were some reunification programs at that time. Um, Jaime, who is down at the bottom, and one of the fun translating things is we had to translate what it meant in English to say that they cut the cheese. You just think about that a moment, but not too long. Um, just a translating moment. But Jaime was working with an um, underground uh, student newspaper. His office was raided. He decided to leave. And by association, his fiancée, Imelda, had her apartment raided. And to protect her family, she felt that she needed to leave. And later on, then they reunited um, at Jubilee Partners and were sent on to Canada. Next slide. This family is pictured on the day that they were leaving for Canada, uh, the whole lineup there. And I don't know, Carol, if you recognize Carol and Bob, if you recognize me over there with my very short haircut and my son next to me in the blue t-shirt. But uh, Myra and Marie Lou and many children, many children have made this excruciating trip. And all of these trips started with some act of violence and absolute fear. I just really want to point out that when we talk about economic or uh, political refugees, I don't know how to separate those because the politics make the economics. And if you have a fear for your life and you can't make a living, in my experience, none of these people are moving up here just so they can move into a rambler. They are fleeing for their lives. And in this case, their grandparents had done something in the village that was um, subversive, big word, for the time. And the, the grandparents were hung in the trees in the front yard as, as a, a warning, as this is the way that you could get control over a whole village by just using a few people um, as these dire examples of what would happen to you if you continued whatever it was. Next slide. Samir here is, uh, or was, a former soldier mechanic, as it says. And um, he got very curious one day about what was going on inside of this big semi-truck that he was fixing and <clears throat> discovered that it was a uh, traveling torture chamber. This worked very well for the government because you could pick up somebody that was either accused by somebody else of subversive activities or just simply was doing something that was not approved of. You could put them in the back of the truck, goes down the road, you do your torture, and then you drop them off very often, um, either dead or near death. And what happened to Samir is that when he found out, he tried to go AWOL, and he was captured, put in the back of his very own truck, and um, left for dead. But some people did find him. And it took him over six months to travel um, mostly on foot again and working his way through Mexico until he got to the Texas border and was detained at the Corralon. Next slide. Now here's a face of a guy that is a little bit maybe more close to home and being a teacher, this is your homework. But I invite you to Google Rene Hurtado, which was not or is not his real name. I, I don't know if he's gone back to his uh, name of birth or not. But he arrived in the Twin Cities and was one of the very first to really make the headlines in the media. And the St. Louis Presbyterian Church took him in more or less in a sanctuary situation. Um, and they brought him to Brainerd. I did translating for him for the Quakers and also for the college. And he stayed. And I believe it took almost 20 years for his paperwork to finally um, make him into a United States citizen. And what the backstory is for much of this is these people have to pay money for lawyers. These people have to pay money for translators. These people have to go through all a system of lots and lots of documentation. And they have to prove that what happened there was worthy of their being considered for asylum or refugee status here in the United States. It is a long process. 
and one of the first men to come through the Franciscan Sisters Convent. I believe Tomas, that one also took about 20 years, not to mention the support from the Franciscans and all of the finances that went into becoming a legal, taking the legal path that we all clamor for. Next slide. So transformation questions. As I just said, the politics and the economics, can you really sort them out? What about multinationals that have sweatshops and want labor? What about growing um, you know, all those bananas and sugar and coffee, which really can't feed your family and go somewhere else? And the what and who are left behind, the men generally leave first. And so there are villages throughout uh, Mexico and Central America and beyond where the women and the children and the elders are basically left behind. So the total social dynamics, you know, are, are pulled apart, re, reformed. The reality of the journey, horrible, hard work, perseverance, coyotes, people who are willing to rape, willing to rob. Um, what conditions would it take for you to leave everything and undertake such a journey? I put this question to people not as a confrontation, but I think people would do well to learn a little bit about the motivation and the trials that went into this decision. As in the poem that was read by Susie this morning, um, to be able to taste your foods, to smell your favorite, in this case, jasmine and... Would you want to leave this afternoon with the clothes on your back and carry your children? Next slide. I put these children up again because they just became two of my bestest friends. And there are so many difficulties faced and many children now come on their own. Some children were brought here very young and are now the group called the Dreamers and I believe they need protection. Some of them don't even speak Spanish. They've never been to a Spanish speaking country and families are still being divided. Families are still being deported. And some people, these children um, are being sent back to places that was never part of their actual living experience. Next slide. So this brings me to today. Yesterday afternoon, I was in Little Falls and I visited some Franciscan sisters and they are again taking in a family. It is a family that arrived in January. They are from Venezuela and that is their um, passport, but they have family in Ecuador. And you may or may not have been hearing for over the last months how the Venezuelans are being sort of accepted into the United States now because of the politics. But many of the Venezuelans themselves have fled to neighboring countries to flee their own government. And yesterday's story opened up to me, I guess, a new facet, because Yosa Ling, the mother of this new family, said that they fled to Ecuador to be with her mom because in Venezuela and Ecuador, they now have a new government policy of repatriation. So those who fled to Ecuador are now sort of being shipped back to Venezuela. And one of the leading protesters, a young man, I think it was two or three weeks ago, was pulled out of his bed in Ecuador, taken away by the forces back into Venezuela, tortured, and he was killed. And um, so I still need to look that up today, but that is the most recent. So Yoseling and her family at this point decided they had to get out of both Ecuador and Venezuela. And there's a place called the Darien Pass. It takes about five days to walk through. It's a jungle. 400,000 immigrants have walked through that pass. So first they went through Central America. Their one child is seven years old and Jeremy is pretty much incapacitated. I can't even pronounce what it is that he has, but he also has epilep epilepsy. He is seven, he weighs 35 pounds, he cannot talk, he cannot walk, he's on a bottle and diapers, and they walked at the beginning, five days through the jungle carrying this young boy. Yet Yoseling told me that going through Mexico was even worse. 
They got to Eagle Pass at the border and at the bus station, they were kidnapped, divided up. It cost them $3,000. They had to get $3,000 together between family members in Venezuela and Ecuador. Everybody scrambled. They paid the kidnappers. And at that point, the Franciscan sisters that work on the Texas border um, came in contact with them and became their sponsors. So presently, they are being housed by the Franciscans. The kids are in school. They're all taking English classes. Jeremy needs medicines. Yoseling just got glasses this week because while being kidnapped, she ended up sick and had a, a very long and high fever, and they feel that it has damaged her one eye. And they just want to work. They want to pay off the kidnappers. They want to start this new future without being, you know, pending on everybody else's goodness. And um, they have an a lawyer and they're going through the asylum process, but it takes, as you now know, time. Next slide. So how do we react? What do we do? Oh my gosh, you know, this is, this includes, I don't know, their, their mental health. This includes their inability to get anything going while they're waiting for the systems to work. Well, the response of the First Congregational Church in 1989, when those first people I introduced you to headed to Canada for their first winter ever, one of Dominga's questions to me was, not what I expected, you know, what's Canada? What's my new life going to be? Oh no, another transition. Oh boy, what am I? She wanted to know what snow was like. How was that going to be to live with snow? So the women of the First Congregational Church in Brainerd this was their response for the first winter, crocheting and knitting for every single one of those refugees, which I think there were 35 or 40, uh, a set that included a cap, mittens, and a scarf. So does that answer the question? No, but it's one of the answers. So end slideshow. So today, hmm, I'm hoping that if this has not been on your radar, that seeing, although not totally meeting these people in person, gives you some of the stories and some of the faces that the media is not presenting. With the theme of transformation, I looked up, um, let's see, the synonyms to transformation and renovation was one. So. I would like to see the immigration laws in this country and policies renovated. It is broken, as you have heard. We need policy changes, I believe, and we need to understand the root causes and how we are involved and have historically been involved in what has been going on to create these situations. Change, we could change our attitudes and our vocabulary, words matter. Vilifying these people is not the way to go. I don't need to tell you that, I'm sure, but the militarization of the border is not helpful and the divisiveness is not bringing us together. And my third word is metamorphosis. Instead of crawling around like a bunch of caterpillars, it's time, I think, to come together and Become a butterfly, as it were. So biblically, the one message I think is do unto others. And when you look into these people's eyes and really listen to their stories, you can see yourself. And by the grace of God, go we, or however that sentence goes, what separates us from being, you know, a refugee or an immigrant one day? And how would we want to be treated and it's a big, big, big thing, but I would just like you today to think about how far a smile goes, how far a buenos dias goes. And even though, you know, Yoseling needs a green card and she needs an iPhone and she needed glasses, what she wanted yesterday was to take home a big bucket of ice cream for her family. 
And that's something I could do. So whatever the next step is on your path, it might be little and it will be little, but peace on the journey and do unto others. Gracias. Thank you so much, Jan. And thank you for the work you do with immigrants. Our closing words, I don't know if the mic is on. It is, OK. <laughs> Our closing words today um, are from Jean Ricard. We have a calling in this world. We are called to honor diversity, to respect differences with dignity, and to challenge those who would forbid it. We are people of a wide path. Let us be wide in affection and go our way in peace. Amen. And we will um, extinguish our chalice. Oh. <laughs> Well, we will speak the words at any rate. <laughs> Let's join together in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please rise in body or spirit and with your hands over your heart or holding a hand of those next to you or whatever posture is most comfortable for you, we sing words of blessing one to another. Go in peace.
finalized. <laughs> okay.